began a new sermon series last week uh, involving the idea, the concept of trusting God. And we spoke about trusting God in the midst of the unknown because frequently that is the way our lives tend to run. We, we don't know what's ahead and so it, uh, it gives us calls and pause for the days ahead. This morning I want to talk with us a little bit about uh, trusting God in the midst of the uncertain. Trusting God in the midst of the uncertain. If you want to turn your scriptures to Mark chapter 5, we're going to be using a fairly familiar story out of that uh, chapter to address uh, these thoughts this morning. And uh, it, this particular story sits in the context of an additional story. The other story serves as kind of bookends for it because this story happens right in the middle of the other one, and I'll introduce them both in just a second. But uh, some time back, and I don't know, it's been several years ago, I guess, now I heard this question posed and this answer uh, posed in response to it. The question is, what do you do when you don't know what to do? You ever had that situation arise in your life? <laughs> yeah, Tim, Tim's already got his hand up. <laughs> uh, nothing, do nothing. That's what a lot of people make. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Well, someone posed the, this response, and I, I think it's a, a fairly accurate one, accurate one. Your first thing to do when you don't know what to do is to do what you know to do. Um, I'm, I'm always, and I think I've commented on this before, I'm, I'm always um, kind of amazed with folks that, that uh, Christian folk that go through a difficult time, and one of the first things that they'll do is cut out their experience uh, of uh, worship or uh, involvement in, the, in church activities. I'm just, I'm just, you know, I just am lost. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, things are uncertain, and I just don't, don't know what to do. And, and so they cut out the very thing that they should be doing, oftentimes. And I've never been able to get my head around that. And I'm, uh, I'll be 66 in just a few months, and it still just baffles me why we would cut out the thing that would be the most important thing to do when we don't know what to do. Now, all of us have. Uh, encountered those moments when we didn't know what to do. And so we start exhausting all kinds of possibilities to, to the point that maybe we get to where we say, well, nothing can be done. We just, just don't know anything that can be, can be done. And in the book of Mark, chapter 5, Jesus has a series there of about three or four uh, miracles that he performs. One in the early part of the, of the book that involved uh, a man who was possessed by demons the second one shows up in verse 21 when Jesus is approached by some folk, including the uh, leader of the synagogue in that particular area, a fellow by the name of Jairus, who was begging Jesus to come and heal his little daughter, daughter who was dying. And then the one that we want to focus on this morning begins uh, actually in verse 24. And so um, this, is, uh, this is where we want to begin. So Jesus went with him, speaking of Jairus. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her uh, body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him and he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the truth, the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And while Jesus was speaking, some of the men from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, came and said, your daughter is dead. There's a great crowd that has kind of 
uh, you know, come up around Jesus, kind of collected around him in this moment as he's fixing to go to the household of this uh, synagogue ruler, a fellow by the name of Jairus, because he has a daughter who is sick and apparently sick unto death. And in the midst of this crowd, there's a woman who was also suffering from physical uh, health uh, issues. For some 12 years, she had had this, this bleeding, this hemorrhaging issue. Now, according to the Talmud, which is the, uh, the commentary of the, uh, uh, of the rabbis on the Old Testament, according to the Talmud, there were at least 11 possible cures for the type of illness which she had. Some of them were legitimate he, uh, uh, prescriptions or uh, uh, cures. Some of them were just merely superstitions, but there were at least 11. Now, think about this woman who some days would perhaps say, Uh, I'm feeling better today. Maybe I can do so-and-so. Some days are worse. There's no way I can even get out of bed today. Another doctor's appointment. Doctors in the ancient world were uh, regarded with skepticism, if you will. Sometimes they did good things, sometimes not so good things. My grandmother, Voss, used to say all the time, stay away from doctors, doctors will kill you. And just about every person that I know went to a doctor. At some point, if they didn't live, they died. So, you know, that's pretty much the way it works. It makes me think of Agnes Moorhead and her her character, Mrs. Snow, in the Disney classic Pollyanna, who, uh, commenting on the fact that she couldn't get better, made the comment that, uh, and that doctor, all he gives you is pills, just pills and bills, pills and bills, that's all. How many of you have felt like that from time to time? Just pills and bills. The Bible says that this lady had suffered much at the hands of doctors. She was like a guinea pig. Maybe they had never encountered anything quite like her and her situation. And so uh, from time to time it was try this, try that, try the other, try some new thing. It reminds me of when my mother was still living. She had a very severe case of rheumatoid arthritis. And she went to doctors frequently and and everyone else that uh, considered themselves a uh, a Granny Clampett style doctor was always recommending things that my mother could do to alleviate the pain and issues of her rheumatoid arthritis. Here these doctors have practiced on this woman for a long time. That's why they call it the practice of medicine and experimental drugs because we just aren't really sure if any of this is going to work, but go ahead and try it. Apparently, this woman had met her HMO deductible and had spent all of her cash, the money she needed to, to live on or support her family. And where do you stop in the midst of all this? Where, do, you, do, you, do you think, I've tried everything there is to try. I'm not going to try anymore. Where do you draw the line? In, um, in the German language, there is a phrase that we learned in seminary called uh, Sitzenleben. Sits in Laban, and it simply means one's setting or situation in life. And every one of us has one of these. It, it, it varies because some of us have a very good situation in life. Maybe we're healthy, maybe we're happy, maybe we've got plenty of money in the bank. We have a, a wonderful situation in life, but others, Sits in Laban, isn't quite so good. Hers, this woman's, apparently grew worse and worse and worse to the point that even her spiritual health was suffering. She had no business being in this crowd. Did you know that? She wasn't supposed to be there. Because of her condition, her situation, she was to be kept away from the community. She was to live as an outcast. Anyone who contacted her, came in contact with her, was contaminated. And so she was not supposed to be there. You can read in Leviticus chapter 15, verses 25 and following, uh, a nice summary of the kind of thing it talks about here. When a woman has, a, has any kind of bleeding issue, she is not to be around other people. And the Bible talks about all the prescriptions, the, the ritualistic, ritualistic prescriptions she was to go through to, to make certain that she was clean in order that she could be among people. But she couldn't keep on offering these sacrifices day after day after day. That would break you up as well financially. Now, I don't know uh, uh, what excuses people give for not going, coming to church all the time. Uh, some people, people say, I'm sick and really don't feel like it. Well, that, that can happen. Some folks say, I have to work. That's true. Some say, I'll be out of town. True. Some say I have it's an emergency. I can't. It can't be helped. Other people can say, "Well, I, 
didn't remember to set my clocks up this morning. As I look around this morning, that would include a lot of folks. But none of us have probably ever been told, you can't come and worship in this place or wherever. You, you can't do that. But this was her plight. This was her situation. The instructions for this had come from God himself. Her uncleanness kept her from become, being able to be in a place where she could even worship God. Her pain and her suffering and her inconvenience are met with even greater tragedy. I'm forbidden from worship. At some point in time, she hears about a fellow by the name of Jesus. Maybe she's heard all about his ministry, the things he's been doing in the, in the area. And news travels fast, especially among the infirmed, because we like to talk about our maladies and our illnesses and everything. And so I tried this and it worked. I did that and it, and it worked. I tried this and it had no effect whatsoever. But this woman foregoes any kind of, uh, of religious protocol and says, I, I, you know, I know I'm not supposed to be there. But she attaches herself to this crowd. Maybe she's hoping that no one will recognize her and cast her away. Maybe she's hoping or that perhaps she can get close to Jesus and he will touch her and heal her. Or maybe she's hoping that she can uh, uh, get close enough that she can touch him. And, of course, that's what we see happening here. She reasons with the ultimate faith, if I can just touch his clothes. Now, you know, that's... Well, that's really going the extreme, isn't it, when we start talking about faith. It's one thing to have the, the healer touch us, but it's another thing to say, if I can just touch the healer's clothes. Now, I think we've talked about this in time past because I think I've actually spoken on this text before. But this, this, requ- this statement that she's making is based on something that God gave uh, to the Israelites in the book of Numbers. It's in chapter 15. It begins with verse 37. Let's read it together. Just a few verses to kind of get our perspective on all this. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, Throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. You will have these tassels to look at, and so you will will remember all the commands of the Lord that you may obey them and not prostitute yourselves by going after the lusts of your own hearts and eyes. Then you will remember to obey all my commands and will be consecrated to the Lord, uh, to, your, to your God. These tassels that hung on men's garments were representative of the holiness of, of man in the Jewish nation. This represented his holiness. And so what she's actually saying here is I, if I can touch the, the holiest part of, of him, I can be healed. Touching these tassels that hang from the hem of his garment will heal me. And so she moves ahead with ultimate faith and, and, hopeful, and hopeful faith during a time of great uncertainty. She replaces her uncertainty with a, a, affirming faith. Anybody in here ever touched an electric fence? Okay. We, yeah, we've got a, I've got a few peers out there. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, you know, the thing about it, if you touch it, it's one thing, but if you take hold of it, it's an entirely different matter, isn't it? I stand before you as one who's done the latter. And, and, and had my grandfather not been close enough to pull me away, I, I, it could have killed me, I suppose. But as a matter of fact, I grabbed a hold of it and turned loose, but I couldn't get my hand away because it, it had me. And that, what power? What power? The way it works is the toucher borrows power from the power source, and for a moment... The source is momentarily diminished, but the toucher and the source experience something very extraordinary. And those of us who've tried this know what it's like. This woman touches Jesus' clothes. Immediately, both of them experience the moment, the Bible says. The woman, in her case, her bleeding stops. The floodgates uh, of blood have been held back. Leviticus 17, 11 says, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and hers was flowing from her constantly and continuously, and now that's, her life was ebbing away, and now that's been taken care of. She felt better. Now, you can tell if you have a headache or a stomach ache, and you take a medicine and it goes away. You can, you, you can know that, but how do you know when you have a hemorrhage that stops? In her mind, somehow she knew, finally this was an end, at an end. And Jesus... The other participant here, uh, a knowing 
participant says, what just happened? What just happened? This isn't normal. In a crowd of people, he asked, who touched my clothes? You know, there's touching and then there's touching, isn't there? There's touching that it just happens inadvertently or there's touching that happens with meaning. Some touch just has more meaning. And Jesus has this sensitivity to touch, a heightened sense of touch or feel. Some of us may have magnified senses. Do you have a magnified sense? Uh, I have a, I have a, 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 a real uh, lack of the sense of smell. My olfactory nerve, you know, uh, I just can't smell many things. Fried chicken, green beans, and roses, and that's just about it. And I'm glad they all smell good. Okay. But I have a very keen sense of touch. I, I can tell when a microbe's crawling, crawling on my skin. My nephew, who's an air traffic controller down in Louisiana, told the story a few months ago of looking out the window and spotting a helicopter and said to the rest of the guys in the tower, there's a helicopter, and they said, where? And they pointed, and they looked on the radar. It was 15 miles out. That's good eyesight. Jesus had this ability, the type of touch that he experienced drew power from him because he was being touched differently by this woman than anyone else in the crowd. Everyone was pressing in, but this was different. William Barclay, the great uh, commentator, says, here's a universal rule of life. We'll never produce anything great unless we're prepared to put something of ourselves, of our very life, and our very soul into it. You won't produce anything if you don't really put yourself into it. And he's speaking to preachers now. And he, when he says, no preacher's ever preached a real sermon, ever descended from his pulpit without a feeling of being drained of something. If we're ever to help men, we must be ready to spend ourselves. Now, I can tell you, most Sundays when I come down and stand out in front of here, I'm just about wiped out. You know, the tragedy of this whole thing, this story, in a sense, is the number of other folk who must have been there Dozens, perhaps, which, which had infirmities which could have been healed if only they had been willing to touch him differently than they were. You ever been in a situation where someone, where you have uh, you think seats are numbered or something and the, and the number next to you gets called? <laughs> they just want a new car. Oh, boy. You ever, you ever had that happen to you? Maybe not quite that extreme, but it's interesting, isn't it? That uh, some people can get so much out of a situation while others seem oblivious to it. Like the disciples, they were, you know, they were focused on Jesus here in this, in this regard. They missed everything that was taking place here. They're saying, what do you mean someone touched? We're jammed in here like sardines already. Everyone's touching you. Jesus continues to search, doesn't he? Looking around, he repeats his question, who touched, who touched me? And the woman the woman knows she's been discovered, and she wonders, perhaps, have I stolen something to which I was not entitled? Maybe she's thinking, if I can just get away from the crowd, then including Jesus, no one will really know what happened. I'll be okay. But alas, the time comes to fess up, if you will, realizing what's happened to her, realizing that Jesus apparently knew what happened, realizing she had broken religious and societal laws, Like a criminal on the run, she decides to give herself up. And she comes forward with trembling. And and this is one of those things I think is uh, very appropriate for us when we think about this from from the standpoint of salvation. Philippians 2.12 says, Paul writes this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. She comes trembling and she falls at Jesus' feet and contesses, confesses the entire matter and episode. Had, had she really done something, something so terrible? After all, Jesus was uh, healing people everywhere. He was on the way to heal someone else's daughter. Why, why couldn't she just give him a test run right here, find out what, what he was able to do just by touching? She's taking a big gamble, big gamble, Because you look at this, what's Jesus going to say? What emotion might she have evoked in him? What curse might he pronounce on her for doing such a dastardly thing as this? Jesus has something marvelous to say to this woman, doesn't he? 
He has praise for because he begins by saying, your faith. You know, interestingly or not, he's surrounded by disciples and other people apparently who believe, but not a single one of them, not a, no one in this, in this group is ever singled out for his or her faith, but this woman who has reached out in uncertainty. Even those who uh, came to Jairus and said it was no longer, uh, Jesus was no longer needed didn't have any faith. So Jesus assures this woman that she's been healed. And who is it among us who doesn't want to hear that we will receive that for which we have asked? Every one of us. He not only has praise for her faith, he has blessing when he says, go in peace, don't worry, everything's fine. Physical healing has come, now emotional stability or calmness can be present. He has promised, doesn't he? Be freed from suffering. No more pain and suffering. Now, let's kind of wrap this up with just a brief statement this morning. We often read these kind of stories as if they're quote-unquote spiritual fairy tales. These so-called once-upon-a-time antics of a strange visitor from another planet who came to earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. And so we stand, end up standing in awe of him and of all those special individuals mentioned in the Gospels who have seemed to come, who cross from the common mundane faith of just going to church on Sundays to the faith of drawing power from this one we call Jesus to the extent that their lives are actually transformed both physically and spiritually. Now, we might chastise ourselves by saying things like, I could never have faith like that. Or praise ourselves with words like, sure, I bet she was physically healed, but I bet my, I bet my uh, commitment to faith is, is greater than hers. Let's be honest. Did we really, really know what this was about to take place in this woman's life? Or had she come to a point in life that it was so hopeless that she was willing to take a gamble on anything, even that thing which might be uncertain? Now, some of us would say that she had no choice because she was down to her last, the last resort. And to view the situation like that, however, is to miss the point entirely. Here's the point. Here's the point. What actually occurred was that she realized Jesus was not only the last resort, he was the only resort. And we waste our time on the spiritual doctors of this world and the things we think will make our lives better and easier and all this. And and, uh, there's only one resort for spiritual healing. And if I I really need to say what that resort is, then 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 we probably weren't listening today. Last week, as I mentioned, we talked about Trusting God in the midst of the unknown. And today we've looked just a little bit at trusting God in the midst of the uncertain because we come to him not knowing what he might do because we all have uncertainties in our lives. We all have uncertainties in our lives. We just don't know from day to day what it's going to be like with these uncertainties. And so the question we have is, will Jesus embrace my uncertainties and help me and deliver me in my time of need. Now, m- most of us, or many of us at least, have, have been uh, uh, inside the faith arena of, what it, of uh, what it means to be a Christian for a good portion of our lives, uh, for our years. We, we've seen this over and over again, and, and, and we're tried and tested, more or less. And then there are others who've only gone through a few battles or a few situations or a few difficulties. And there's some who haven't gone through hardly any at all. But those who have gone through them and have emerged victorious on the other side know that the uncertainties of this life are always handled by a Savior who knows there are no such things as uncertainties because he's already got it mapped out. And so what he wants to do for us today Maybe not physical healing, although that is extremely possible and maybe likely. God wants to heal us through Jesus Christ spiritually. But it's only when we're willing to humble ourselves to the point that we're willing to to get down to the lowest point so we touch the hem of the garment. That's the power is found in him alone. And if you're here today and you're outside of him, we encourage you and we invite you 
to make a decision to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, and for the rest of us to learn that the uncertainties of this life are not uncertain to him. He has it all worked out.